All right, we've got a few announcements to go over today just to make sure everybody knows what's coming up this week and what today is. Um, so first of all, just to make sure everyone is aware, if I can find... Sorry, my app is struggling a little bit. Um, just to make sure everyone knows, we do have a website, followhimwithus.com. Lots of things on our website, past sermons, calendar, ability to give. We've got lots of stuff there. We also have an app, Follow Him With Us, on the Apple App Store and Google Play Store. So for those that have not been with us before, we want to totally confuse you by having multiple names for our ministry. I am sorry. Our overall ministry name is Follow Him With Us. The whole goal was when I left my career to follow Jesus, I'm going to follow him as hard as I can. You follow him with me. Then along came the church years later, and we're at a barn with silos, so it just became appropriate to call it Harvest at the Silos. So we're one and the same, but our website is followhimwithus.com, and our app is as well. We also have a Facebook page, <laughs> and to switch it up on you, it's under Harvest at the Silos. And then this is my phone number. If you want to get on our texting app, you can text me there. So I'm going to leave this up for just a moment because I'm going to talk a little bit about our calendar and a few things coming up. So Wendy mentioned our Seder meal. Bless you. You're welcome. For those that don't know what that is, when Jesus had his last supper with the disciples, that was a Passover meal called a Seder. So we're Gentiles, we're not Jews, but we can do some things Jesus did. See, it amazes me. People say, I want to do what Jesus did. Well, Jesus had this Jewish dinner called a Seder. Well, that's weird because that's Jewish. No, it's what Jesus did. He was Jewish. <laughs> so we mimic some of those things, and one of those is tomorrow night at 630. We have to go past sundown because the Jewish day starts at sundown, so Passover starts at sundown. So it's going to be like 630 to 930. So we'll start, we'll have a meal before, and then we'll go into the ceremonial, if you will, of following what Jesus and his disciples would have done. We only see communion come out of that, but it was so much bigger, and Peyton will walk us through that tomorrow night. We do have about 10 spots still open if you haven't registered. Um, you can go on our website to the calendar. and re In fact, if you go to our website, it's the first thing that will pop up. You can click on it and register. Okay, also you'll see on our calendar Thursday, May 2nd. That is the Cookville Day of Prayer. Some of you may remember last year, the boys, Peyton and Parker, were invited to Cookville on the National Day of Prayer. The good news is our country still celebrates one day of prayer a year. Some really horrible things get months. We get one day. Anyway, we were invited to come to Cookville for the boys to blow the shofars before, and they both prayed. This year, they're going to blow the shofars, and Wendy's been asked to pray. Uh, I'm just the chauffeur to get everybody there. It's on a Thursday. It's going to be like leave at 9 a.m., get home at like 5 p.m. If you want to go with us, please sign up. It's free. It's just we need to know if we need to get a little bus, a little van, or if we can carpool in a couple of cars. I think last year we may have carpooled in like three cars or something. It was a year ago. I don't really remember. <laughs> Two. Thank you. Well, I'm a preacher. We have to exaggerate everything. It's pastor math. You got to up everything 30%, <laughs> except for tithing. Then we down it. No, I'm just kidding. Sorry, if you didn't notice, we make a lot of jokes. We try to have fun in church. All right, here's another non-churchy thing. On May 12th, Mother's Day, you mothers are going to get a break. No church that day. <laughs> Courtney, want a break. <laughs> I asked Wendy, what do you want for Mother's Day? To take church off. Deal. <laughs> That's not exactly how it went. So you'll see that on the calendar. Um, also, I want you to please pray on Tuesday. The book gets released. And this is a super big deal because I'm praying that God blesses people with the book. I'm praying, praying that God blesses our finances with the book so we can continue doing ministry. So the book is called Will Jesus Know You? The whole premise is we ask people, do you know Jesus but Jesus has twice in Matthew, he says, get away, I don't know you. So there's lots of people you know, but they don't know you. So we want to make sure Jesus knows us. So the book is called Will Jesus Know You? You can buy it on Amazon. If you're a faithful giver to this church, you're getting one for free. But you don't get it until May because there was a little bit of a mix-up. And I thought I was getting the books on the 23rd. I don't get them until mid-May. You can order it off Amazon, and you'll get it Tuesday or Wednesday. 
But if you if I'm going to give it to you, it's going to be May. I know it's confusing. Um, the last thing I want to talk about before I jump into giving in the sermon is I want to talk about the true calendar for Holy Week. So a month ago, the American church celebrated Holy Week and Easter. Everybody remember that? What if I told you that Friday, this past Friday, two days ago, was the day that Jesus would have rode into Jerusalem on a donkey? If you've seen my Facebook post, you've seen that already. So God's calendar, the biblical calendar, doesn't line up with our Americanized Roman Gregorian calendar. And Passover is when Jesus went in to celebrate Passover, to be sacrificed as a Passover lamb. He's the ultimate lamb sacrificed for our sins. Because of that, we don't have to sacrifice anymore for sins, right? Super important. So I think it's also important that we celebrate his true death, burial, resurrection on when it happened, not when the American church says it happened. And if you've been with us, you know that sometimes it's a day or two, like last year it was two or three days off. This year it's almost a complete month off. And I don't understand why that doesn't bother people. So we celebrate it at the real time Friday. It's, again, it's confusing because it technically started Thursday night at sundown. <laughs> so when I say Friday, that's Thursday night at sundown till Friday night at sundown. Jesus would have rode a donkey into Jerusalem as they would have celebrated as Peyton told us last year. Last week, we say Hosanna. The Jewish or the Hebrew word is Hosanna. Did I say that right, Peyton? He, he grimaced and he did this. <laughs> Oceana. <laughs> hey, look, I'm working on it, okay? I'm trying. Five years in and I'm trying to learn how to say one Hebrew word. It means save, please. Lord, please, Lord, please save us. Please, Lord, please give us success. So Jesus rode in on a donkey. And we teach often that that was for humility's sake. And there is a piece of humility there. But it's also what Solomon did when he was declared king. He rode a donkey into Jerusalem. So many of you know when Jesus did something, sometimes it had double meanings. And we only dig for the first meaning that's easy. We don't dig to the deeper meaning. Literally, Jesus was declaring his humility as well as, I'm the king. They weren't expecting a humble king. They were expecting a warrior king. But they were praising him as he entered the city. You guys ever had a really great day, and then like six, seven days later, you're having really bad days? Well, your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, knows what that feels like. He was praised. I feel like I can't say it now. Hosanna. <laughs> and then, just a few days later, crucify him. Okay, so yesterday, Saturday, April the 20th, is when Jesus would have been teaching in the temple. You can read about this in Matthew 21 through 25. Today is when the woman poured out expensive perfume on his feet, quote, preparing him for burial. And would you know it, there's a double meaning there. He says in Matthew that she's preparing him for burial. But also, when a king was crowned, he would have had this same expensive lard perfume poured over his head. So when they saw Jesus coming in on the donkey, then they smelled Jesus, they would have said, he's the king. But then what he did next didn't make sense for the king, right? So we're just trying to get to a little bit deeper meaning. This is also the day, today, that Judas would have met with the leading priest to agree to betray Jesus. So I'm just trying to bring us into what the calendar actually is and kind of bring it to life. It's not just some story. So Monday at sundown begins Passover, and that's when, when they would have had their dinner, the Lord's Supper, Seder. Tuesday he would have died. So think about that when you wake up on Tuesday. This coming Friday would be the day he arose from the grave. So what we celebrate in the American church is Easter Sunday is actually this coming Friday. Okay? So I'm going to try my best. I'm not going to be perfect at this. I'm trying to get the timeline correct. I'm putting it on Facebook. Peyton is going to teach us a Passover lesson next Sunday. We decided to do that instead of having a service. I talked about maybe having a service like Friday, but we have service today, Seder tomorrow. Some people will be here for some training Saturday, 
and then service Sunday. So we're just going to let Peyton do it on Sunday. Everybody good with that? Okay. What do you say? Was I the only one in the room when we talked about it last night? Sorry, he takes after his mother. <laughs> I'm sorry, Lord. I'm sorry. <laughs> I know, evil speech, right? I repent. <laughs> I'm sweating a little bit right now. I can feel it coming. <laughs> Woo! Giving scripture today, Luke 16, 13. This is also recorded in Matthew in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is being very clear. No one can serve two masters. You will hate one and love the other. Hadn't James told us that recently? You will love one and hate the other. You'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. So this is bigger than a giving scripture. When we give, we're giving back to God a portion of what's already his. But it's also freeing us up to not be enslaved to that money because we think we got to keep every little penny. And when we start to give, that's when freedom comes. So, again, we have, uh, sorry, wrong slide. We have many options and ways to give. We have a giving box in the back, out the back door there. You can give cash or checks. Checks payable to follow him with us. You can give on our website. You can give on our app. Or for those that Venmo us, we very much appreciate that. You can Venmo us, PayPal us, all that. If you have any questions, just come see me afterwards. And we'll figure it out. All right, Chris and Gina got to leave early today, so I got to preach fast. But when I say it's going to be a short sermon, that's like Wendy saying it's going to be a quick prayer. Once again, I apologize. <laughs> it's gonna come. <laughs> Parker said at least y'all don't have to be in our house later. See, she's slow to speak right now. <laughs> she's living out what James said. Yes. All right, we're going to jump into, oh, you know what? There was one more thing. I knew I was forgetting something. So I got to keep you posted, updated on the biblical war that could be happening. Could be, may not be happening. Um, Israel and Iran. So as you know, a week ago Saturday, Iran bombed Israel. It was a miracle, nothing short of a miracle that those bombs didn't do destruction. Now, the media is downplaying that Iran had a weak response. You should actually listen to the Israelis talking about the miracle that they shot down everything. It's a miracle. It is not a weak response from Iran. It's a miracle. So don't let the world lie to you. Then this week, Israel retaliated. Iran had said if Israel retaliates, it's going to be on. We're going to come full force. Well, Israel retaliated. Also called a weak response. Don't let the world tell you that. Just keep your eyes open. But we're not going to be in fear because God is in control. Be still and know that he is God. I think this is a scripture we're going to have to hold on to right now. But anybody know that when Passover was about to happen, Pharaoh had a bunch of plagues that he sent to Egypt. Remember that? <laughs> was that Eli that said what? Are you going to have to go back and read your Bible, Eli? There's a lot of plagues, and one of them was blood the river red well this week iran did anybody hear this iran had torrential flooding like iran in that region gets like four inches of rain a year they got 10 inches in one day that's unbelievable and look what happened in iran the water running into the sea is red and this happened on the 16th just a few days before passover Ironic timing? I don't know. Huh? <laughs> Just a coincidence, Isaiah, I'm sure. Yes, of course. All right, now we're going to jump into James. I know we're kind of all over the place today, but 
I'm going to dive in. A lot of times I do a recap, but today I'm going to just dive in. And for those that haven't been with us, this is our 10th week on James. Don't worry. I'm going to kind of catch you up in the sermon this time, okay? But I got a question for you. I got handouts. Look at my faithful wife. I made fun of her twice, and she reminded me to give out my handouts. Today's message is about humility and see what the Lord just did there. I don't I didn't hear what all you said, Parker. Now, okay, as you get this handout from Ella, our faithful servant, the title on top is wrong. That was last week's title. This morning. I just had a slip. I told Jennifer my secretary failed me. She said, who's your secretary? It's me. (laughs) And I got them all printed, and I got down here with Pete, and I looked, and it's got the wrong title. But that's okay. I'm going to give you the title here in a minute. While she's handing those out, I forgot something I want to talk about with Pete. So Pete and I were driving here this morning, and Pete is our resident expert on joy. If you don't have joy, hang out with Pete, and it rubs off on you. It's contagious, and he always says, I'm fantastic. You may think we're making fun of him. We are not. When we say that, we, it rubs off on us. This morning when I picked him up, he said he wasn't doing fantastic. And so we were talking. Don't worry, Pete. I'm not going to share all the details. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> We were talking, and he was talking about how I have so much faith. God has blessed me with so much faith, and how that faith has rubbed off on him. And I was like, Pete, that's what this church is about. That's why you go to church. That's why you get around the body of believers, because I had something he didn't have, faith, and he needed that. But he has something I don't have a lot of times, and that's joy, and I need that. And so this morning, he didn't have his normal joy, but I had it to give back to him. He's usually giving it to us. That's why we come to church. Hopefully, we learn something, we praise God, and there's lots of great things we can do. But as we get to know each other and we become family and we know what each other's good at, we rub off on each other in a good way. So I just want to praise God for the joy that he brings us to Pete this morning. And by the time we drove here, 20-minute drive, Pete's like, I got my joy back. Praise God. Praise God. All right, now we jump into James. I got a question to start out today. When you fail, how many of you fail? Okay, everyone who didn't raise their hand, go ahead and raise their hand. (laughs) Courtney, you you acted like you didn't. (laughs) When you fail, is it the devil's fault? Is it Satan's fault? When we sin, we mess up, do we immediately think the devil made me do it? We shouldn't. We shouldn't, but do we? How many of us have done it? I'm raising my hand. It's his fault. Okay, hold on to that question as we process through the teaching today. As I said, we're just going to jump in, and it's going to seem like we're picking up at a random place, but bear with me. We'll tie it back together. On top of your sheet, you got James 4, verses 6 and 7, and he gives grace generously. As the scriptures say, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. All right, I want to pause for a minute. It says, as the scriptures say. Anytime you see the words, as the scriptures say, in the New Testament, where is it referring to? The Old Testament. James didn't have a New Testament. James wrote the first book of the New Testament. So if he wrote the first book of the New Testament and he says, as the scriptures say, he's referring to Old Testament. It's just a little side note. I always try to point it out. If you learn nothing else, hopefully you will know that the complete Bible from beginning to end is relevant, important, and should not be thrown away despite what pastors are saying today. If you're not aware, there's a lot of pastors today actively saying throw away the Old Testament. And you cannot do that. All right. He gives grace generously. And as the scriptures say, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. So humble yourselves before God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. I don't know about you guys, but when I think about the book of James, previous to teaching on it, because i got a lot more up here to think about now, but when I think about the book of James, I think of two things. 
Number one, I love the very beginning of James where it says, when bad things happen to you, I'm paraphrasing, when bad things happen to you, consider it what? Joy. Thank you. Opportunity for great joy. Instead of, oh, woe is me, I got problems. No, James says when problems come your way, it's an opportunity for great joy. That's the first thing I think about with James. The second thing I think about is James 4, 7, resist the devil and he will flee. So I love it. We're finally at one of my favorite verses, but we're going to dig into it a little bit. Because as I've already said this morning, with be still and know that I am God, we often get this one little scripture, one verse, and we quote it all the time, but we don't take into context all the scripture before and the scripture after. And in this case, the scripture before includes the whole book of James up until this point. It's not like go back to the beginning of James 4. It's kind of go back to the beginning of James 1 to get the context of how, what has led up to verse 7. In James 1, 5, he says, if you need wisdom, ask our generous God, and he'll give it to you. We covered that. We've covered it many times. In James 3, near the end, when he's given out what I've called the good list, and we dissected that last week, well, and the week before, I think. He said, if you're wise and understand God's ways, prove it. Do good works with humility that comes from wisdom. So he lays out that true wisdom from God manifests itself into doing good things, into that good list. Peace loving, gentle at all times, obedient to instruction of others, full of mercy, good deeds, no favoritisms, always sincere. See, I'm trying to beat this list into your head. Because we all can name off Galatians 5, the fruits of the Spirit. But how many of us can just off the top of our head name off James' good list? So I'm going over it time after time. Now in James 4, he says in verse 6, and he gives grace generously by what? You got it right in front of you. What does he give grace by? Humility. Humility. So we ask for wisdom, we'll get it. God's generous in giving it. Prove that you have it by doing good works in humility. Prove it by living out the good list. Now you want grace. You get it generously, too, from God to the humble. But he opposes the proud, gives grace to the humble. So I want to make sure we understand what he means here. It's a theme. Now, my translation that I often teach out of, you guys know, is the New Living Translation. It says he gives grace generously. I put this in front of you. Your Greek lesson is on paper in front of you today. The Greek word for generously there is megas. That's where we get the word mega. Great, abundant, large, intense, strong, mighty. I'm not sure we understand the word generous. We think generous, like, oh, he's a very generous person. He gave me money or he gave a donation or they gave their time. No, it's bigger than that. Often when we dissect the words, it has a different meaning than we have in English. It's deeper. It's bigger. It means great, abundant, large, intense, strong. It's actually the same word you would describe like a hurricane, like a violent. A violent storm would be called a mega storm. So it's not just that he gives us generously in our words. It's he gives us great grace. He gives us grace abundantly, large grace, intense grace, strong grace. Mighty grace. It's huge. And I want you to get your arms around that. What he has to give us in terms of grace is huge. It's big. It's intense. That should be a great promise for us. I'm going to kind of give you a good promise, and I'm going to kind of beat you up a little bit, and then we're going to end with some good promises. Okay? Deal? Thank you, Pete. He just challenged me. <laughs> But his grace is only great, abundant, large, intense, strong, mighty, megas, if we humble ourselves before him. That's the key piece. Don't expect his mighty, great grace while we're walking around being proud. We have to be humble. So let's look at two more Greek words. Tapanos is where we get the word humble. It means not rising far from the ground, lowly, depressed, brought low with grief. Maybe we think humility just means I admit I'm wrong. But humility really means I am so low and des I'm desperate 
I know how much I need the grace of God because I know how lowly and desperate I am. It's actually where we get the term dirt poor. We're so low, we're like the dirt. She's like, I ain't like the dirt. <laughs> now, maybe we should say dirt poor in spirit. Not just dirt poor. <laughs> but when you realize how lowly you are and that you're nothing without God's grace, that's when you get it generously. You need to know how much you need it to get it abundantly, to get the great grace. Does that make sense? It's realizing how much we need God. Some of us don't think we need God <laughs> until crisis, right? But this is realizing how much we need God, even on our best days, and we're going to tackle that in a minute. It's realizing how filthy we are without God. I told you I was going to beat you up a little bit, and then we'll bring it back. But don't get too depressed yet. We just need to fully understand what humility means, but it's okay to be depressed because humility actually means being depressed. Sometimes we need to let people live there in that place because that's when we yearn for God and beg for God and reach out to Him. Now, we don't want to stay there forever. There's a balance to all of this conversation, okay? But sometimes we see somebody depressed. We're like, oh, don't, 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 be, don't be depressed. Don't be depressed. Maybe we're ruining their humility by not letting them live there a little bit. We want to be there to help them. Yes. All right, let's look at the word grace. Because in Christianity, I'm going to say something. that Just let me explain it. I have these moments every week. I'm like, I'm going to say something that's going to sound really dumb. But please let me explain it. I think we have this word named grace, and we've dummied it down to only mean eternal life. And if that's all it meant, it's great. But it means more than that. You know, we say the grace of Jesus saves us, right? Well, the Greek word is charis. It means joy, pleasure. See, it means more than salvation. Joy, pleasure, delight, sweetness, loveliness, goodwill, kind, favor, reward, and gift of salvation. That salvation thing is one of many things you get when you get God's grace. So I'm trying to help us understand a few things here. When it says you get God's grace generously, you're getting a whole lot more than you realize. In intensity and greatness and in what all you get. You're not just getting salvation. You're getting all these other promises. Joy, pleasure, delight, sweetness, loveliness, goodwill, kindness, favor, reward. But you don't get those great things unless you realize how low you are. So let's plug in our Greek lesson for the day. God gives us great, abundant, large, intense, strong, mighty, joy, pleasure, delight, sweetness, loveliness, goodwill, kindness, favor, reward, and gift of salvation when we realize how lowly we are. Man, I wish that's the translation we got. We had this simple little thing. God gives you generous grace when you're humble. But I put this in front of you because I want you to understand how much deeper that verse is. God does some amazing things for us when we realize how lowly we are and how much we need him. Unfortunately, in the world, in the church today, you don't see humility a lot. You see pride. So remember, James, I'm not through beating you up yet. James has told us that our evil thoughts cause us some problems, right? Remember, back in Genesis, God told us that our, ev our thoughts are evil from birth. So I'm going to ask a question. And I promise this is not a trick question, but it's a little area of humility I'm going to share with you today. How many of you have ever heard that Paul said our best is like filthy rags? Here's my moment of humility. Paul didn't say that. But we've been taught that all of our lives in church. Isaiah said it, not Paul. 
where I was going with that was I was going to go to a place of all these people in the Bible that tell us how much we need God. And I went looking for that scripture on Google because I couldn't remember where it was and I couldn't find it. This is why we got to read our Bibles, people. Because pastors have said this for years and years and years and years and years to the point that we all are kind of like shell-shocked right now. I had y'all built up with that great grace thing, and now you're like, holy crap, <laughs> I've been told lies all my life. This is what's wrong with the American church. We talk about traditions and what's been said instead of digging into Scripture for what it actually says. I don't want you to be mad at anybody. I just want you to know it was Isaiah that said it, not Paul. I am humbled to know that. Because I started out in my notes to say, how many of you have heard what Paul says about us? Then I couldn't find it. Because my promise to you is if I'm going to say it, I'm going to show it to you in a scripture. So let's go to Isaiah where it really was said, chapter 64, verses 5 and 6. We are constant sinners. Man, Isaiah was such a positive guy. <laughs> how can people like us be saved? We are all infected and impure with sin. When we display our righteous deeds, they are nothing but filthy rags. This doesn't take away from what was said. It's just that someone else said it. Because atheists will pick Christians apart when they know they know our Bible better than us. They will spend time, by the way, Finding our inconsistencies so that if you ever engage with them, they tell you, you want, we were, we're, it was during COVID, we were out at Kroger singing, trying to bring hope and joy to people while everybody they thought the world was shutting down. And this guy came up to me and he goes, you want to talk about Jesus? Hang on, I'm going to go to my car. And he came back with a Bible ready to argue with me. He's an atheist ready to argue with his Bible because of all the inconsistencies we have as Christians. This is a little bit of a side note, but maybe humility right now is realizing how much we need God and how much we need to get our heads in the Bible and how much we still have to learn. So I don't know how to describe what Isaiah said politely. I'm going to do the best I can. But the term filthy rags doesn't mean that was like a, a rag that I wiped sweat off my forehead with or I changed the oil in my car. It's a pretty strong word. It's a translation of the word Hebrew word idah. Probably not saying that right. I'll be humble about that. It literally means the bodily fluids from a women's menstrual cycle. The word rags literally means rags or garments used to clean that. So our best, Isaiah says you're a filthy sinner and your best is like filthy menstrual rags. I'm sorry that that's descriptive, but that's the word of God. Those rags, Peyton said, would disqualify you in Jewish tradition from allowing you to go into the temple. If you remember the woman that bled for 13 years, we see a miracle. She reached in and she grabbed the, the hem of Jesus' garment. And that's awesome. It was a miracle. But if you step back and look at it, that means for 13 years she couldn't enter the presence of God. You think she felt lowly? You think she felt, I mean, she's crawling on the dirt they're probably trying to get her away because if they get close to her, it makes them unclean and they can't. And she reaches through and touches the hem of Jesus' garment. Would have been tassels like Peyton and Parker wear, by the way, hanging off his garment. And she's healed. It was bigger than a healing. Yes, the healing's great. But now she's cleansed and she can enter the presence of God. Praise God, we have the Holy Spirit living in us and we don't have to do all that. We're cleansed by the blood of Jesus. But I just we just want you to understand the impact. When Isaiah said that, it's pretty strong. He's saying our best is bad. Okay, everybody get that? I promise there's good stuff coming. James told us we're supposed to do good deeds. It proves our faith. James told us do your good deeds with humility. You've got to understand how lowly you are, how much you need God, and you need to understand that your best is still like filthy rags, and that proves wisdom. So we want wisdom, but are we willing to achieve that lowly humility to get wisdom? 
But the world often presents wisdom with pride. Having wisdom is a prideful thing. I know it all. Humility, on the other hand, is realizing you don't know it all and you know virtually nothing and you need to be constantly learning. But the world says wisdom is knowing everything. Scientists, they know everything. When 2020 happened and everybody shutting down churches and we stayed open and we got criticized, I said, hey, I read the Bible. They lined up in Peter's shadow to be healed. But scientists who are more wise than you say this is going to kill everyone. The world's wisdom is bathed in pride. Biblical wisdom is bathed in humility. So if Paul didn't say that, that Isaiah said, what did Paul say? This is a little bit of a kind of a punch. Romans 3, starting in verse 9, I'm kind of starting in the middle of the verse. All people, whether Jew or Gentile, are under the power of sin. So he's making sure that we understand that just because we accepted Jesus, we're not exempt from this, okay? All people, whether Jews or Gentiles, are under the power of sin. As the scriptures say, as the scriptures say again, it's Old Testament. No one is righteous, not even one. No one is truly wise. No one is seeking God. All have turned away. All have become useless. No one does good. Not a single one. Their talk is foul like the stench from an open grave. We're getting some vivid imagery here from Paul and from Isaiah. Their tongues are filled with lies. Snake venom drips from their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. They rush to commit murder. Destruction and misery always follow them. They don't know where to find peace. They have no fear of God at all. And I thought, I thought Paul is the guy that lifted us up all the time, told us we could do anything we wanted to, and the grace of Jesus is there to magically fix it all. But James has already told us our thoughts are evil. God said our thoughts are evil. Isaiah said our best are like filthy rags. And now Paul basically says, we're all losers. It's the new Jason translation. You're all losers. We're all losers. I'm with you. But in humility is realizing all of this and therefore realizing how much you need the grace of Jesus Christ, the incredibly great grace of Jesus Christ to save you from your incredibly cr great sins and sinful life. It's not about being perfect. It's about trying. It's about humility, humbling yourself, doing the good deeds to try to gain wisdom. And understanding how much we need the grace of Jesus that, yes, it does cleanse us. We finally get to verse 7 of James 4. So humble yourselves before God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. See, the problem is we often start with that verse, resist the devil and he will flee. But James has spent a lot of time building to this point. And it's kind of the final point of a progression. So, what do we do? I start there. I'm being tortured right now. Something's not going right in my life. I'm being tempted right now. I'm being oppressed right now. I'm full of fear right now. So, I'm going to resist the devil and he will flee. But then I'm resisting him and he ain't fleeing. Why? Then I get discouraged and I give up. That's the normal Christian progression. It's a cute verse. To where in the moment, we're trying to resist the devil, and he ain't fleeing. We can't figure it out, so we give up. We think we're not doing something right. But the problem is, that's a promise. Resist the devil, and he will flee is a promise. And that promise is at the end of a lot of hard work that has to happen before. You realize since we started James, James 1 to James 4, 6, it's hard work, hard work, hard work, hard work, hard work, hard work. Stop and think. Self-evaluation. Change this. Do this. A lot of hard work. Then we get to the promise. But we're selfish humans. We want the promise without the hard work put in. That's why we're not getting that resistance and fleeing moment because we're not putting in sometimes the hard work to get to that moment. We want the promise at the end. I'm probably going to offend some people with this one, and I'm sorry. It was just the first thing that came to mind. How many of us have been on diets before? How many of us want to, like, lose weight? I want to lose 30 pounds this week. I'm going to go on Jenny Craig, 30 pounds this week. But then we don't want to put in the hard work. The promise is losing weight. We don't want to put in the hard work. Look, 
If Paul can say all those things in James and Isaiah, don't get offended by me talking about a diet, okay? <laughs> what? <laughs> What'd she say? <laughs> she said it's called a diet because it dies out. That's exactly right. Oh, let's take it to something else. What about Scripture? I just I want to know Scripture off the top of my head. God supernaturally put that Scripture in my head. But we don't, we don't want to do the hard work of actually going and digging in and reading it every day for hours a day for five years to get to that point. I remember 11 years ago, God's called me to leave my career and go into ministry, but I don't know enough. Man, these guys recite Scripture off the top of their head. How do they do that? And someone gave me wise advice. Start reading your Bible and read it every day. And 11 years later, I'm like, oh, wow, I never thought I'd be at this point. I still got a lot to learn, I realized the other day, because I thought Paul said the filthy rags thing. But I can also spout off a lot of Scripture off the top of my head. So my point is you got to put in the hard work to get to the promise. Sports people, you want to be really good at a sport. You just want to wake up and have the natural genes of LeBron James and Michael Jordan, right? But you got to do steps A, B, C, et cetera, to be that superstar. And for some of us, there ain't enough steps to be that superstar. So we become preachers. <laughs> because I've said this before, I'm going to say it again, Jesus is not a genie. Wave the wand and fix our problems. God is not a vending machine. I want A6 because that's this for today no you got to put in the hard work up to it so i've laid out some things there on your sheet so you understand some of the steps and you can read james and probably get a whole different set of steps but james said i'm going to go with kind of an a stop and think that was our theme last week it's been our theme all along you got to stop and think before you talk before you act before you get your feelings hurt before you get angry there's a lot of things that stop and think encompasses Maybe a B would be do something with the Scripture you've read. Don't just read Scripture. Do something. Maybe a C would be your thoughts are evil. Are you taking them captive? Or are you teaching them to obey Christ? Are you acting on them? Maybe a D would be are you even asking God for wisdom? Are you doing good things out of humility? Are you doing more things in the good list than the bad list we laid out last week? Maybe E would be understanding that you have a life-giving spirit in you that God passionately gave you that your human will can squash. Anybody thought about that this week? Anybody thought about how many times our human will squashes that powerful Holy Spirit living in us? I did. I had a moment with someone at the wedding two days ago at rehearsal that I had to live out everything I'm teaching y'all. I'm still working on it. Maybe an F would be be humble. Realize how depraved you are, your depravity, your need for God. Okay, now we did A through F. Now resist the devil and he will flee. The promise came in step G, but you ain't done A through F. Don't expect the promise. Do the steps before, then expect the promise. We want G, but we didn't want to start with A. And we hit on this last week, but I think it's important to hit again. Do we understand the power of the Holy Spirit that lives in us? That's why we spent a whole week talking about it. Spent one whole week on one verse. Do we understand the power of the Holy Spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead, that lives in you, that gives you the ability to do A through F so that it helps you get to resist the devil and he will flee? But that's not what we normally do. I've got another list, and I don't, I don't think I put this on your paper. Maybe I did. I can't remember. If we're honest, our list is usually, number one, I have an evil thought. Number two, I act on the evil thought. Number three, disaster happens. Number four, I feel guilty and remorseful. Shouldn't have done it. That was dumb. Number five, oh, thank you, Jesus, for your grace. Number six, let me tell you again, Jesus, how special your blood is. Number seven, now I'm going to resist the devil. Why ain't he fleeing? So I got this picture, and I've done this in pre-service before. I think this is part of our problem. 
I think this is part of our problem. I'm fighting off demons all the time instead of realizing it's just a consequence of something dumb I did because I didn't do all the things James told me to do beforehand. The grace of Jesus will cover every mistake I ever made, but it does not take away every consequence of the mistakes I've made. If I kill someone, the consequences, I will go to jail for the rest of my life or death or whatever. I can be in that prison covered by the blood of Jesus, helping other people get saved. So I can be saved. My sin can be forgiven. I still got a consequence. If I get drunk and go out and drive a car and plow into another car and kill someone, that's vehicular homicide. It comes with consequences. I can be saved, forgiven by Jesus. You may keep going or do you get the point? You get the point. Hey, I told you, I, we got a little private thing. I won't, we won't talk about it, Pete. <laughs> so let's go back to pride. Let's go back to humility. What was the original sin in heaven with Satan? Pride. I'm as good at, say, I did, I'm not saying this, just for the record. <laughs> Satan said, I'm as good as God. I'm as good as God. Believe me. Follow me. I got better things for you than God. That's what Satan said. That was the original sin, pride. But what was Adam and Eve's first sin? Pride. But you got the scripture there in front of you, Genesis 3, 12 through 13. The man replied, that's Adam. It was the woman you gave me. Her fault. It's always her fault. Uh, but what else did he do? It was the woman you gave me. Not only is it her fault, God, it's your fault. The woman you gave me caused me to do it, God, and I ate it. Verse 13, then the Lord asked the woman, I, I don't know what happened to verse between 12 and 13 where God smacked Adam around a few times after he got blamed, but verse 13, then the Lord God asked the woman, what have you done? The serpent deceived me, she replied. That's why I ate it. You see what both of them did? They both blamed someone else instead of taking responsibility for their, their actions. That's the easy step, and that's pride. So you may say, I don't have pride. You blame everybody else for your problems, you got pride. Adam blamed the woman and blamed God. Eve blamed the serpent. Neither one of them said, oh, God, I screwed up. I'm sorry. How many of y'all in this here this week have blamed someone else for your action? Don't raise hands. I'll go ahead and raise mine, though, because I'm sure I've done something to someone. <laughs> We're still doing the same thing nearly 6,000 years later, blaming others. Don't take accountability for our actions. And when you cannot take ownership for what you are doing wrong, that's called pride. When you blame others, it's called pride. When you blame Satan or demons for your mistakes and failures, go back to the picture, that's pride pride satan made me do it so if you want a simple formula because i like simple formulas i'm a simple person pride blames others humility says it's my fault it's on your sheet pride blames others humility says i own it you ever seen a sports star do something dumb and they just kind of like it's I, I, it's on me i'm a bad pass bad whatever i messed up that's actually a sign of some kind of humility. Now, once again, we've got to talk about balance because I'm not talking about letting Satan take you all the way down to the extreme of self-pity and I can't do anything right. And everything that happens in the world is my fault. There's a balance to all of this. I'm not talking about taking on someone else's problems because they won't take on their own problems. I'm talking about just owning up to what is yours. Starts with evil thoughts. And when we don't do something with those evil thoughts to teach them how to obey Christ, it turns into evil actions. Then it turns into blaming others. And then we wonder why we can't resist the devil and he won't flee. That's why the correct title that's not on your sheets is, Did the Devil Make Me Do It? And the answer is probably not. Do, do you understand that the devil's not omnis op omnipotent? Big words today. The devil's not omnipotent, he, omniscient, omniscient, 
I don't know if I'm getting the right word. He can't be at every place at the, at the same time. God is at every place at the same time. All y'all are looking at me like, I don't know what the word is. <laughs> Omnipresent, omniscient, omnipotent, I think they're all the same. See how lowly I am? I don't even know the word I'm trying to use. This is what happens when I go off script. <laughs> God is everywhere at all times. The promise is the Holy Spirit lives in you. He's in each of us all the time. Satan can only be at one place at one time. I don't want to really wreck your thunder, but do you think he has time for you? Probably not. Now, his evil angels may have fear, control, abuse. You know, so we can name off some evil angels, and maybe they're the ones tormenting you. But we're out here blaming the devil, and he's over here working on Netanyahu and uh, whatever prince of Iran guy and all that. I hope you're getting the point. When we fail, is it the devil's fault? Sometimes, yes, maybe. But sometimes it's just us. It's just our fault. But when it is our fault, don't blame him instead of taking ownership. I even heard someone talking, it was a couple weeks ago, I was listening to a podcast, and a guy said, you know, I realize that we say things as Christians. We say things like, um, I mean, I can be out mowing and there's a thorn bush. I'm like, dang it, Adam and Eve. You know, if you would have just acted right, we wouldn't have this thorn bush and I wouldn't be working so hard. What are we doing? We're blaming them. We're actually going backwards to blame them for what's bothering us today. Super simple, but I've done it this week <laughs> with thorn bushes. <laughs> but we do have a fact in life, and we've been told this by James. We will be tempted by the enemy. We will be tested by God. Remember James told us, God tests you, enemy tempts you. We've got to get those right. God does not tempt, but he does test. Satan tempts. Jesus went through all the testing and temptation. Do you understand that he has gone through every single thing that you could possibly go through? Everything. Rejection. Remember, two days ago he's riding in on the calendar. He's riding in and they're laying down palm leaves. Save us, Lord. And by Tuesday or Wednesday, I can't remember what I told you earlier, they're saying crucify him. There's an argument that there's a different group of people doing that. We'll get into that later. Maybe Peyton will get into that next week. I don't know. But Jesus also fasted in the desert for 40 days, and at his weakest point, Satan showed up, offered him some worldly things, right? Remember, he did it three times. I'm not going to go through them all. We've done that before. But Jesus resists the temptations, and then it says the devil fleed. He resisted the temptation. But does anyone remember in all three scenarios what Jesus used to resist the temptation? Scripture, Scripture, Scripture. So I'm out here going, well, Paul says our best is filthy rags, and I'm wondering why the devil won't flee. The devil's going, I know Scripture better than you, you moron. That's Isaiah. Remember, Satan quoted Scripture to Jesus. He, saw, he quoted Psalm 91. I'm telling you, this one rocked me. I know it rocked some of y'all too. It rocked me. Saturday or Friday night, I was like, I asked Wendy, I was like, am I the only one that's ever taught this? No, she's like, I did too. I was like, whoo, I feel a little relieved. So we do have this promise that we can resist the devil and he will flee, but we got to make sure we've done our part. We got to make sure we're not standing in pride, wondering why his promise hasn't come true. The devil may tempt you, but he didn't make you do it most of the time. So if you don't remember anything else today, I want you to remember, humility says it's my fault, pride blames others. Because if we get that right, we're going to get some other things that are going to fall into place. By the way, when it says resist the devil, it means to set oneself against. It doesn't mean like, stop Satan. It, it, it's like an active military stance is what it means. It means to withstand, to resist, to oppose it's literally like a military stance against something, an enemy. I'm doing everything I can to resist what's coming at me from Satan, and then he'll flee. 
not a simple word out of my mouth. I'm taking an active stance against him. We've got to understand our own depravity, to be humble, to resist him, and to realize how much we need the great grace of Jesus, right? Quick sidebar. We're getting close to being finished. I know you got some more scriptures on your sheet, but we're getting close. I want to make sure we understand what evil means. How many of you know what the Lord's Prayer is? Hopefully everyone. Um, how many know how it ends? I, this is not on your notes, by the way. Matthew 6.13, I'm going to give you the NLT. I'm going to give you the NIV, the New King James, and the King James. I'm going to make a point. My NLT says, and don't let us yield to temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. Okay. The NIV says, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. The New King James Version says, and do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Do you see a consistency there? Deliver us from the evil one. But this is one time, and you don't get this many from me, that I'm going to actually defend the King James. It says, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. There's no one there. This is significant, and I want to explain why. The Hebrew word is ra. It's not evil. It's ra, R-A. And it's got a much deeper meaning than the evil one. Number one, it means to have physical protection. So if the wind blows and that tree falls through here, it would kill me, right? I'm praying for that not to happen. That's physical protection. Or maybe when we're driving down the road, we're praying for another car not to hit us. That's physical protection. That's evil. Satan can attack us through physical calamity. That's evil. Number two, it means to have protection from being tempted by other people to do evil. So I'm praying that none of y'all will tempt me, and you're praying that I won't tempt you. Number three, it means to have protection from your own selfish desires. Finally, number four, it means to have protection from Satan. It's a complete mistranslation and all three that I gave you to begin with to say the evil one. When you pray to deliver us from evil, you're saying deliver me from physical calamity, deliver me from all y'all's problems, deliver me from my own problems, and finally deliver me from the evil one. Does that make sense? That's hugely important. We're not just fighting the enemy. Half the time it's other people helping us do evil or ourselves doing evil, and we're blaming Satan instead of all taking responsibility and making some changes and fixing some things. Satan can come from all of those. He can have the physical thing happen. He can have you tell me a bad thing. He can have me tell you a bad thing. But we have a part. And I'm sorry if it's depressing you that we're going here, but we're going to end with two great promises. If you're depressed, by the way, that's humility, so it's not a bad thing. You have a Savior, Jesus. He shed his blood for you to protect you. That's what we're going to celebrate this week in the true Holy Week. He left you the gift of the Holy Spirit, the greatest gift in the world. Lives in you, same power that raised Jesus from the dead. When you realize how desperate you are for his blood and the power of the Holy Spirit, now you resist the devil and he will flee. You get that first promise. But let's quickly read verses 8 through 10 of James 4 to get our second two promises. Come close to God and God will come close to you. Doesn't that sound like a cool promise? After you've done all of steps A through F and all that, and you've resisted the devil, now come close to God. We want to get close to God when we're not doing A through F. The promise is do all these things, then come close to God. He'll come close to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, for your loyalty is divided between God and the world. That was our giving scripture. That's just in our nature. Let there be tears for what you've done. This morning, I just listened to worship in here. I'm crying. I'm not sad. I just have tears for my past. And I'm trying to live out what James is saying. Let there be sadness instead of laughter, gloom instead of joy. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up in honor. There's your second one, second or kind of third promise. So you do steps A through F, you get the first promise. Resist the devil, and he will flee. Now that you've done all that, come close to God. He'll come close to you. That's a good promise. And finally... Continue this humility thing. Be sorry for what you've done, and the Lord will lift you up in honor. Those are great promises if you do your part. And I think G James just single-handedly destroyed prosperity gospel. 
<laughs> with those verses. You know, you get this great promise. You're still filthy, but you get a great promise. <laughs> but it requires thought, evaluation. Stop and think. Resist the devil. Now come close to the Father. He'll come close to you. Be sad for what you've done. Now he'll raise you up. So, guys, I just want to reiterate. Make sure your loyalty is not divided divided between the Father and the world. It's super important. Let there be tears. It's not a bad thing when you listen to a worship song and cry your eyes out. It doesn't mean necessarily you're just you're sad. Maybe it makes you realize how humble you are or should be. Then he'll lift you up. Then he'll come close to you. Once again, not Satan's fault all the time. Sometimes it is. Most of the time it's our fault. American church needs to get their arms around that. Humble yourself, repent, change, come close to God. He'll come close to you. He'll lift you up. Incredible promises if we do our part. Father, thank you for your word of instruction. Thank you that you didn't just expect us to figure this out. You laid it out. If we would just have the humility and wisdom to read your word and live out what you want us to do. So, Father, I'm guilty of all these things. I realize how much I need you, but thank you for showing me so I can work on them, and thank you for the blood of your Son. And, Father, we're not trying to be prideful, I hope, in saying that we're honoring what he did this week. We're trying to say we want more of you, and we want to celebrate it when it should be. Not just go along with the flow of the American church, which has taught us wrong scripture all of our lives. We want to be close to you, Father. So, Father, honor. Lift us up. Come close to us, Lord. But, Father, I pray that everyone is encouraged to do those first steps. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to say this before you get started, Peyton. Uh, as you were saying that, um, the Lord reminded me, God knows your heart. He knows when you're trying and when you're not. So sometimes we get overwhelmed. That was not a message to get overwhelmed that you've got all these steps that you're... God knows when you're doing it and when you're not. It's for you to try, and I love how your mind thinks God meets you halfway. No, God's already there before you even get there. And so... The thing is for you today is when you try to do those steps, I love how the Lord will already be there. You can feel his presence, and he will help you walk through all those steps, and you will find yourself better off on the other side. But just like Jason was saying, we've got to learn that we've got to start being repentive and being humble because this whole thing with pride is why we're where we're at today. And while we're still on the struggle bus. Quick reminder, tomorrow's Passover. Okay, here's the not fun thing that I've been meaning to talk about for a couple weeks that I haven't. Because I keep forgetting. Passover is long. I know that children cannot sit through all of it exactly. Although, you should see Jewish kids. They sit there and like three hours in, they're all asleep. And they're like, ah, we got half the thing left to do. Don't take offense if you have a child. I'm going to look at Monica. Monica doesn't have any. She only has adopted children in this room. I'm going to look at Monica while I say this. If your child is loud, please take them outside. There we go. (laughs) I was going to teach the Seder tomorrow night, but I'm thinking now I'm going to let Dad do it because I want to hear about Pharaoh sending the plagues. I haven't heard that version of the story, and I'm kind of interested. And then Pharaoh stuck his finger in the Nile and it turned to blood. I want to hear this. I'm excited. I haven't heard this part of the story yet. (laughs) So what, is that pride me blaming it on you? Okay. May the Lord, may the Lord blessing keep you. May his grace shine upon you. May the Lord lift up his
his countenance upon you and give you peace and give you peace may the Lord may the Lord bless and keep you may his grace and his face shine His countenance upon you and give you peace and give you peace. Give a rechecha Adonai vishrecha. Ya erpanan vilecha vi. Adonai Pana Vilecha Viasem Lecha Shalom Viasem Lecha Shalom This is the way you shall